Hello everybody, welcome to another video. My name is Jack and today I'm going to be ranking every Spider-Man movie from the worst to the best. If you're new to the channel, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications. And join me in the comment section to share your ranking of the Spider-Man movies and some of your favorite memories of this franchise. So, over the last eight weeks, in honor of the 100th anniversary of Columbia Pictures, all eight live-action Spider-Man movies have been re-released in theaters. I got a chance to see a couple of these. Seeing some of these movies on the big screen was just an amazing experience for me, and I figured because a bunch of you have probably finished just watching through all the Spider-Man movies again, I figured it would be a great time to just sit down and rank all 10 theatrically released Spider-Man movies from worst to best. This list isn't going to include any of the Sony Spider-Man universe spin-off films like Venom, Morbius, or Madam Web. Let's be real, those would all be pretty close to the bottom. Nor is it going to include any of the Avengers movies that have Spider-Man in them. Those being Civil War, Infinity War, and Endgame because those aren't necessarily Spider-Man movies. We're focusing on how well these movies handle Spider-Man and his related characters, world, and universe. So this is going to be a very focused list to movies that just have Spider-Man directly in the title. Enough talk. Without further ado, let's just get into this. Coming in at number 10, we have The Amazing Spider-Man 2. This movie is pretty bad, but don't get me wrong, it definitely has its redeeming qualities. This has some of the best web swinging we've ever seen on screen, the suit is just gorgeous looking, and the cinematography here through and through is simply amazing. There's some powerful scenes in here too, like the Electro Times Square fight scene is such an awesome villain turning point that's really powerful, not to mention the amazingly executed death of Gwen Stacy. And then I feel like a lot of the scenes definitely capitalize on sort of the heart and sensitivity of Andrew's Spider-Man such as that scene where he stands up to the kid who's bullied and how that plays back at the end when the kid stands up to Rhino. And then there's the very ending with the Uncle Ben voicemail that's just amazing. But generally, all these amazing moments and redeeming qualities kind of don't matter because the movie's pacing is just terrible. It's got a two and a half hour runtime, and there's a whole hour in the middle where Peter doesn't do any Spider-Man stuff. He's just trying to figure his life out, and it's really freaking boring. The central romance, too, is very poorly structured. It's like they're dating, they break up, they're just friends, they're dating again, they break up, they're just friends, they're dating, and then she dies. So it's really weird and all over the place in my mind. And then the villains are just bad too. Like Electro, he does have that really cool moment, but the design is really weird. His voice is really weird and just the execution on it is terrible. And then Dane DeHaan is so annoying as Harry Osborn. Like the reason Harry kind of worked in the Raimi trilogy was they had all three whole movies to build them up. But in here, they kind of fit three movies worth of development into one movie and they skip right over Norman, which is a little bit weird. So while there are some things I do like about The Amazing Spider-Man 2, it is pretty hard to sit through. So that's why it stands here at the bottom of this list. In ninth place, I got Spider-Man 3 from 2007, the closure on the Sam Raimi, Tobey Maguire, Spider-Man trilogy. And for me, Tobey Maguire is my favorite Spider-Man, and I think there's some parts of this movie that are just straight up beautiful. For instance, Thomas Hayden Church's Sandman is just an amazing villain with a great motive, and it takes so much growth from Peter to literally forgive the guy who killed Uncle Ben. I think that's just a beautiful thing. But generally, the thing that destroys this movie is Venom being forced in there by the executives at the studio. Sam Raimi didn't want Venom in the movie, but Venom was going to sell tickets, so they forced him in there, and it kind of completely destroyed Raimi's creative vision. Having two villains in there is just kind of overstuffing it. Toffer Grace isn't even the best casting for Venom, and this is kind of a one-note version of the character, too. Thinking of how enigmatic and complex he is in some of the cartoon versions, especially spectacular, and then to see this one-dimensional version of Eddie Brock here is just kind of lame and annoying. And while Peter has the symbiote, he just does some really cringy and just really just kind of stuff. I should always root for Spider-Man in a Spider-Man movie, but in this one, he makes some unwatchably bad decisions, so it's just kind of hard to sit through. And that scene in the dance club is just yeesh. That and Harry's redemption in this movie, which is built up so much over the entire trilogy, it's just completely rushed in here. Like, the butler knew everything the whole time, and he could have saved everybody so much trouble if he had just told Harry the truth right away. So it's just kind of this annoying, unearned thing, and it just feels a little bit weak. From an objective standpoint, this movie is interchangeable with The Amazing Spider-Man 2, but because all the worst parts of this movie made for some really great memes, 
I kind of got to give it a little bit of an edge due to that sort of so bad it's good quality. In eighth place, we have the first Amazing Spider-Man. This is a movie that I've always just sort of thought was kind of fine, and that's really it. And I mean, there's some things about it that are sort of cool. I like how this is kind of a darker take on Spider-Man with a unique atmosphere, and the chemistry between the two leads, Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone, is really good. Prior to this, Mark Webb did some more romantic movies, so that's naturally going to be one of the strongest areas of this film. But the bad kind of balances out with the good in this movie. All the background with Peter's parents is just unnecessary, and it kind of eats up screen time. It's worse in the second movie, but it's pretty bad here. And it's like it took them a while to get there in the comics, so there's no reason we should be going to it this soon in the movies. And I've always found that to be a weaker element of Mark Webb's Spider-Man films. I also don't really buy Andrew Garfield as Peter Parker. I think he's a great Spider-Man, but he's not a really good Peter Parker. Like, he rides around on his skateboard, and he wears his Ramones t-shirt. He's a super cool, super punk rock guy, but how's he able to be smart and nerdy enough to turn a guy into a lizard in under 30 seconds? Like, there's nothing wrong with nerds being cool, but if a guy looks like this, would he really be be getting pushed around by bullies? I don't think so. And then I think the lizard is generally pretty underutilized. He doesn't have that same depth he has in the comics where he has like that kid who's sort of like his anchor to his humanity and the sort of like one thing stopping him from becoming a full lizard. So there's this real tragedy to him that you see in the comics and a lot of the cartoon versions. And that's completely absent in this movie. He's just plain evil and it's extremely boring. I get there's a deleted scene with his son in there, but if the scene and the character were so unnecessary that you could scrap it from the movie entirely, then it kind of just destroys the whole context and execution of the whole thing. Not to mention that his design is just terrible, lifeless, just generic, early 2010s blockbuster CGI crap. I was probably a little bit harsh there, but come on, this is the lizard, make him look cool. So while Tasm 1 is watchable enough and more harmless than the previous two, I've just never felt strongly about it enough to put it higher on the list. I get this is the definitive Spider-Man for some people, and that's awesome, but I've just never really been able to connect with this one. In seventh place, we got Spider-Man Far From Home. This is a movie where I feel like there's a lot to love about it. John Watts just perfectly emulates that 80s John Hughes aesthetic, and it's genuinely really hilarious at times. Ned Leeds is a top three MCU character for me, and the teachers are just hilarious in this movie. The illusion sequence with zombie Iron Man is just amazing because Mysterio's truly a great villain. And the music is great here, that including the beautiful Michael Giacchino score, as well as the great soundtrack compiled of old new wave songs and awesome pop songs in foreign languages. That being said, Far From Home is far from perfect, and it's kind of in a lot of ways the least Spider-Man-y Spider-Man movie. While it's got this good sort of unique personality as a film, it sort of loses its identity as a Spider-Man movie in that. Spider-Man swinging around Europe doesn't hit the same way as Spider-Man swinging around the Big Apple. And it's a Spidey flick where his central character arc revolves around him trying to live up to Iron Man in the moment where he proves himself is by making an Iron Man suit. And don't get me wrong, I cried at Endgame like everybody else when Iron Man died, but I don't need to see a whole Spider-Man movie paying tribute to him. I go to Spider-Man movies for Spider-Man, you know? So while Far From Home has its flaws, it's definitely a really fun and enjoyable movie I can't go too negative on. John Watts just shines with his director's craft. Tom Holland is such a star here, and this sets up for the masterpiece that No Way Home would be. But while it is a great MCU movie in this great sort of John Hughes tribute, 80s comedy Europe vacation movie. I don't know if it serves its purpose that well in the context of Spider-Man films. But coming in at number six, I have Spider-Man, the original, directed by Sam Raimi back in 2002. And just to be clear, everything from this moment forward on the list is a 9 out of 10 or higher. There's just that many good Spider-Man movies that you have to have some of the best ones lower on the list, even though they're still great movies. This is arguably the greatest superhero origin story ever put to film. Sam Raimi integrates his horror background, add this freaky edge to Peter's transformations, and this version of New York City has so much life and personality to it that it's basically a character in itself. The Danny Elfman score truly complements this movie in a great way. It's suspenseful, heroic, melancholy, and creepy all at the same time, and it just adds this neat little layer to the whole thing. There's some great performances from Tobey Maguire, Kirsten Dunst, James Franco, and Willem Dafoe, 
But the obvious standouts to me will always be J.K. Simmons as J. Jonah Jameson and Rosemary Harris as Aunt May. I ultimately think the best thing about this movie is the way it perfectly delivers the message of great power coming with great responsibility. Because the whole first act of this movie serves as an adaptation of Amazing Fantasy number 15. You're able to relate to the highs and lows Peter experiences early on, and you understand why he makes the poor decisions he makes. So when it ends up costing the life of his uncle, you feel those consequences with him, and you're right there in his shoes when he realizes he has to take on this responsibility for himself and become a superhero. There's a couple things about it that hold it back from being higher on the list. I strongly prefer the second one, so I'm less likely to rewatch this first one on any given day. And I'm not just huge on origin stories. I kind of like to see more of the hero in action right off the bat. So this movie kind of has a natural disadvantage for me. And I'm not crazy about the Green Goblin design. I don't think it aged that great. But this is undeniably a masterpiece of a film and easily one of the most important superhero movies ever made. In the fifth place, we got Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And just for the animation alone, it has to make the top five. Every frame of this movie is a work of art. It seamlessly blends all these different styles and influences in a way that feels organic and unique. And so many scenes do these things with colors that you just can't do in a live action film. But to me, the character relationships are what really elevate this movie to the next level. On one end, you have Miles' mom telling him that he can be anything, he can do whatever he wants, and he should always be comfortable no matter where he is. And then on the other end, you have Miguel sort of telling him he's this mistake, he wasn't meant to exist, and everywhere he goes, he's an anomaly. But Miles uses what his mom tells him to stand up to Miguel in the entire universe, and it's such an awesome, epic, and empowering moment. And then you also got Miles conflicted over telling his parents that he's Spider-Man, parallel to Gwen dealing with the aftermath of telling her father that she's Spider-Woman. And I also love the ways that all the different Spider-Men view canon events based on where they are in their lives with what canon events have happened, so they're all going to have a complete different perspective on the flow of the multiverse. The scenes with Gwen and her dad are visually amazing. I normally call that type of stuff cheesy, but here the melodrama feels real and earned. And then the Daniel Pemberton score is my favorite score from any movie ever. The Metro Boomin soundtrack is full of bangers. I especially love the song Am I Dreaming from the end credits. It's just the only reason this movie isn't placed higher on this list is because it doesn't really have a strong sense of finality to it. It just kind of ends on that cliffhanger. And while I think that's fine and does set up for the next movie pretty well, it's a little bit less of a satisfying watch than everything higher up. Coming in at number four, we have Spider-Man Homecoming. And while I do think Across the Spider-Verse is definitely a more mature complex and thematically rich movie i still think that spider-man homecoming is definitely a bit more of an enjoyable watch because it has that sort of stronger sense of finality so it's ultimately more satisfying to view i was nine years old when this movie came out it was one of the first superhero movies i saw in theaters and so i was right there in the target audience and the reason i remember it being so cool was because this was a version of spider-man that just felt so teenage and so high school and so natural much more than the previous two ever did. John Watts just had a really realistic vision for this version of the character. He had Tom Holland watch all the old John Hughes movies for the first time, and he had Tom Holland go undercover in an American high school. And it's because Tom Holland did all this research, he's able to absolutely pull it off. Historically, one of the quintessential aspects of Peter Parker is the awkward teenage thing. He's weird talking to girls, he's really into nerdy science stuff, and then he gets pushed around a bunch. And Tom Holland pulls that that off here in a way where he's both charismatic and awkward at the same time. Vulture is just awesome here. I remember thinking it was going to be really hard for them to make Vulture a cool villain, but they still did it nonetheless. And he's like an actual Vulture too, because he uses the leftovers of all this like alien and robot warfare from the Avengers. So it's just really neat MCU world building. And Michael Keaton is just so charming and relatable here that you understand the villain's motives. I've always loved the homemade suit and the scene where Peter gets stuck under all the rubble is one of the best scenes in any movie on this list. This is the type of small stakes MCU movie that we're missing today. So as I'm putting it at this point on this list, I'm really realizing that I'm over 
overdue for a rewatch. Starting off the top three, we have Into the Spider-Verse, a movie that is just so influential on so many levels. The animation looks like a comic book brought to life. This is the true beginning of that 2D meets 3D animation style, and if it's not for this, then you don't get Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem or Puss in Boots The Last Wish. But on a story level, I adore everything about this movie, especially the characters. Miles is such a relatable lead that has to learn how to take that leap of faith. Peter is the sort of older, washed up, flawed mentor who has to learn the same thing. And then there's Gwen who has to learn how to open herself back up to other people after her Peter died. The supporting characters like Penny, Spider-Man Noir, and Spider-Ham are all hilarious. And then Kingpin is just an awesome villain. I just love how this movie is able to take the Spider-Man premise and do something unique, inventive, out there, and interesting with it while still holding on to all the important things that make Spider-Man a great character. Spider-Man stands for the ideas of everyone being able to be a hero, getting up no matter how many times you've been hit, always believing in yourself to take that leap of faith, and the fact that sometimes it's really hard but you can't save everyone. And this movie perfectly shows all of that. There's several awesome moments in this movie, such as the iconic scene where Miles jumps off of the skyscraper to What's Up Danger, the Kingpin fight at the end, and the Stan Lee cameo in here, just based on the timing and the nature of what he says, it always makes me cry. The soundtrack is just stacked with bangers, elevates a bop, Sunflower's iconic, but my favorite song in this soundtrack is probably Hyde, R.I.P. Juice World. he was the GOAT. Our runner-up... Spider-Man No Way Home. This was the movie that had anyone who held off on Tom Holland's Spider-Man realizing that the whole trilogy was just one big origin story. The first two movies show him as Spider-Boy. This is the movie that shows him become Spider-Man. Here, he fully learns the message of great power coming with great responsibility, and it's so perfectly executed. The plot escalates and the stakes raise more and more throughout the movie. It starts out as just a simple little thing of him trying to get his friends into college, and before you know it, he has to make everybody forget who he is. And this just amplifies the tragedy of the Spider-Man character to 11. Through all Spider-Man media, he's had to keep everybody he loves, knows, and cares about at arm's length to keep them from being hurt. This movie takes it to such the extreme that everybody has to forget that he exists. And it's just the saddest and most honorable sacrifice ever. And the scene at the end in the coffee shop is just amazing. The villains are great here. Alfred Molina channels that same classic energy as Doc Ock. Everything bad about Electro and Amazing Spider-Man 2 is fixed here. And Willem Dafoe as Green Goblin in this movie specifically is one of my favorite villains in the history of comic book movies. Then, of course, the icing on the cake is the inclusion of the two older Spider-Men, those being Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield. Sure, it's fan service, but it's also important for the story. They're there to help Tom Holland in his hour of need, and they're there to redeem themselves. Andrew Garfield being able to save MJ, counteracting the way he wasn't able to save Gwen, and then Tobey Maguire stopping Tom Holland from killing Green Goblin and not making the same mistake that he did. It's all around this beautiful story about second chances, and the three Spider-Men together generates for some amazing comedy. On so many levels, this is one of the greatest comic book movies ever made, and arguably the best blockbuster of the decade so far. In my mind, it should have been nominated for Best Picture. But coming in at number one, we have Spider-Man 2, the movie that to me will always be the greatest superhero film ever made. The way I see it, this movie marks the birth of modern superhero cinema. Sure, before this you had things like X-Men, Blade, and even the first Spider-Man movie, but aspects and elements of those all feel a little bit dated in their own right. This movie is simply timeless, and it's still amazing 20 years later. This is the first superhero movie to really have fun with its premise while taking it super seriously at the same time, and it's just this full-on character study. And when you combine the heart and character-driven stories of this movie with the gritty, darker realism of the Dark Knight trilogy, then you have the formula for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. The main reason I love it so much is the stakes aren't that huge. It isn't about the end of the multiverse or the end of the world or anything. It's just about Doc Ock and he's going to destroy half the city. But because Harry, MJ, Aunt May, and all these people you care about live in that city, it feels so real and so personal that you're just on the edge of your seat the whole time. Peter's arc here is so amazing. He starts by thinking he needs to quit being Spider-Man to have a good life. But when he quits and sees the consequences of his actions, he has to start back up again. 
but at the end of the movie, he finds a way to have a good life as both Spider-Man and Peter Parker, and is through MJ wanting to face those problems with him, which is simply an amazing ending. Doc Ock is truly an amazing villain, and I love the way that Peter's able to appeal to his humanity instead of just beating him in a fight. The Raimi-isms really shine here and add this unique layer of style to the whole thing. Not to mention that the amazing soundtrack had a dashboard confessional song in it that served as my introduction to emo music as a whole. I all around adore every little thing about this movie. It's simply a work of cinema on a profound level in one of the greatest motion pictures ever made. I could seriously talk all day about how much I love this film, but I'm actually saving that for a longer, more focused Spider-Man 2 20th anniversary video coming late June, early July, so stay tuned for it. But that's going to have to wrap it up for my ranking of the Spider-Man films. What did you think of this video? Would you like to see more videos like this? What is your ranking of the Spider-Man films? Let me know in the comments down below. I would love to hear absolutely everything that you have to say about this video. Whether we agree or disagree, it would just be great to hear your thoughts. So thank you so much for watching. That's going to have to wrap it up for this video. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, YouTube, I will see you on the flip side.